Good morning, everybody. Um, hello, my name is Peter Evans, so welcome to our broadcast. Sorry about the slight delay. We've had a technical issue, but I think that's been resolved. Uh, welcome to our uh, discussion today on the emerging platform economy and particularly the globalization of platform companies. My name is Peter Evans, and I'm uh, Vice President of the Center for Global Enterprise and um, one of the research leaders of some of our research initiatives, including our work on the platform economy. I've got um, some new material that we've been working on that I look forward to sharing with you today. So with that, um, let me begin by, by uh, sharing with you this uh, information and giving you a brief introduction for the A brief introduction on the Center for Global Enterprise, if you're not familiar with it. Um, the Center for Global Enterprise is a nonprofit, nonpartisan research organization devoted to the study of the contemporary corporation, globalization, economic trends, and their broader impact on society. It was established in 2013, and we've been working hard to uh, develop uh, partnerships. Um, the center was founded by Sam Palmisano. The uh, former CEO and chairman of IBM. And one of the things we've been working on are um, a series of publications, one of which was uh, a book, um, perhaps the first ebook published by a uh, former CEO, um, Rethink a Path to the Future, in which Sam discussed his experience working at IBM for many years and also um, exploring this issue of of globalization, uh, management practices, and a transition we're seeing to how you develop more globally integrated uh, businesses uh, to be successful and compete in a complex global environment. So today, I'm gonna share some of the materials that we've been um, developing around a new emerging group of companies called platform companies. And uh, you'll be familiar, I think, with some of the examples I have here on the screen, which are uh, Amazon, Google, companies like TripAdvisor, uh, Salesforce, eBay, Uber, Alibaba. In fact, there's a, a growing number of these companies in uh, a variety of sectors. So we find them um, emerging in health. Uh, we find them emerging in uh, uh, the hospitality industry, a whole, a whole variety of of different industries and we're in the process of building a global database um, to collect and uh, identify which are uh, platform companies, how, uh, which sectors are the most um, active, and then also well, how are these companies um, growing and beginning to compete on the global stage. So um, how many countries are they engaged and are there differences between platform companies in terms of their management and even in also regulatory issues regarding platforms um, around the world. So um, with that, I will um, discuss a little bit about um, the uh, underlying research we've been doing on the platform scholarship. There's quite a bit that has been written about platform companies. Um, we've built a database in which we've identified about 612 titles. That's nine books, 18 book chapters, uh, 306 journal articles, and 280 working papers uh, devoted to certain and different aspects of platform companies. And uh, right here you see a visualization of the authors of those works. Um, and the bubbles are sized by the number of uh, times that those uh, authors have been cited in the academic literature. Um, and there's uh, quite a number. Uh, we've identified about 922 authors that have contributed to this scholarly uh, body of work. What's interesting, though, is that there's very little scholarship on the globalization of platforms, that is, um, their cross-border activity. And as um, I'm going to show you today in this presentation, um, platforms are globalizing. And so we see this as, uh, as a gap and an exciting area of research to better understand what's happening on the global stage. Now, just a little bit of uh, context, which I think is instructive and in, 
and, and worth uh, considering, which is the way that companies in the past established speed and scale was really to focus on supply economies. Um, that is to grow um, in size um, and in volume of their product um, uh, delivery. And that way you got declining costs as the volume of your output increased. And so there were strong advantages, uh, competitive advantages to building larger and larger production facilities. So US Steel and General Motors are classic examples of how you grew um, and were successful uh, in competing uh, yesterday. Uh, today, I think the um, conditions are changed quite significantly. We're finding that companies are growing and achieving speed and scale uh, through what we call demand side economies of scale. That is, their value grows as their networks grow. So it's more on, not on the supply side, but more on the demand side. And so you can build strong competitive advantages by building up your network ecosystems as quickly as possible. And uh, two great examples of that are, are clearly uh, Google with their search tool, and now they've blossomed into many other uh, types of businesses. And then uh, Uber as well, there's some interesting uh, scaling um, advantages. You know, the more riders there are, and the more um, people offering rides, the more valuable that service is. So there's this race on the demand side. So we've seen um, an interesting transition from supply side economies to demand side economies. And this is driven uh, largely by this uh, power of network effects. And this is a key critical component to understanding uh, platform dynamics. And this is illustrated by uh, the telephone where you have uh, two phones equals one connection, but five phones equals 10 connections, and then 12 phones equals 66 connections. And so, as you can see here, and this is kind of demonstrates the fact that the more people that are on the platform, the more valuable that platform becomes. And so one of the challenges for platform companies is uh, they, they, they realize the, the, these dynamics, and uh, the question is, is how do you grow that platform uh, as quickly as possible so that you attract uh, the supply side and the demand side so that you can grow this network and, um, and facilitate and, and make that, uh, those interconnections possible. Um, but there are also other um, dynamics associated with platforms that are important. One is this matching function and the ability to match supply and demand uh, effectively. And so uh, companies like eBay obviously are matching people who have goods with people who are looking for those goods. And in the old days, you know, you'd have flea markets and you'd have um, uh, kind of classifieds in newspapers and the process of matching uh, was pretty cumbersome and not very efficient. And today with uh, digital and computing capabilities, that, that matching has gotten very, very efficient. Um, but that's not all that platforms do. Another element that uh, platforms are engaged in is this interaction, in that once you build these networks, you're helping to facilitate interaction on both sides of the market. And this is the uh, recommendations um, and other services that platforms provide that allow the two sides of the market to interact and uh, um, engage one another in ways that weren't possible in the past. And then finally, we have another dimension, which is uh, the innovation side. So many platforms um, um, have opened themselves up and allow third parties to develop um, capabilities on the platform and leverage those platforms um, for their own purposes, which is to gain distribution capabilities. And the platform takes advantage of uh, the new ideas, the creativity of these third parties um, to enhance the value of the platform. So um, I think it's more important to think about these different components that platform providers and various platforms have different um, degrees to which they engage in each of these um, elements. So. There isn't one specific business model. I think it's a combination of these and how you mix and match the matching interaction and innovation. So um, what's also uh, valuable to think about is in the old days, um, companies were really um, there to provide products, right? So in energy, it was building out the energy system. 
uh, in agriculture. It was designing new uh, equipment that uh, could be more eff efficient and effective in uh, cultivating and uh, harvesting crops. In banking, it would be building out your retail. Um, and then in medical, it would be to inter uh, introducing new devices. But with the um, information revolution and computers, we've got this new digital layer that has emerged that's become uh, a place for new uh, innovation, uh, value creation, capture, and competition. And what's interesting is how the platform players are really inserting themselves in between this physical layer and the digital layer. And that's where they're developing uh, tremendous uh, new capabilities, innovation. Um, and so I think one way to think about it is that the, the nature of the firm is evolving to incorporate different aspects of uh, platforms. So <clears throat> you can think of the sort of pure platform players as being very asset light. So the uh, Googles, Ubers, and Airbnbs of the world will have a very small headquarters um, <clears throat> and maybe some field offices, but their physical assets are quite small. However, they've built very, very large uh, platform ecosystems and often are facilitating activity outside of the traditional boundaries of the firm. So uh, Uber, for example, doesn't uh, directly employ drivers and it doesn't own the vehicles, um, which is in contrast to uh, the traditional way of providing taxi services. Similar with Airbnb, they don't own the, the uh, buildings um, or directly employ the people that provide those hosting services. Uh, they're facilitating that through these uh, platforms. Um, then you have kind of a mixed case where you have uh, companies like Apple, Amazon, HP that have uh, manufacturing and kind of your traditional hierarchical uh, organization with a sizable amount of physical assets. You know, Amazon has big warehouses in which they uh, helps them with their fulfillment, but they also have very large uh, platforms. Um, both Apple, Amazon, HP um, have, have grown these uh, app stores, for example, and are uh, very, very sizable. And then finally, we have kind of the traditional companies. You can think of a Daimler, um, a Johnson Controls, or a General Electric which continue to have very, very large organizations, tend to have um, a very large direct employee base, um, but they're also experimenting with platforms. And so <clears throat> they are looking to build out those platform ecosystems. So I've come to think of platforms um, as being increasingly of interest to companies and they're building out uh, capabilities and also understanding how that integrates back into kind of the traditional context of the firm uh, is important.